Good morning. Thank you for joining the fifth of our state tax policy boot camps. So we really appreciate you spending some time with us each of these uh, you know, Tuesday mornings and also each of you who are listening in later. Uh, we do have all of these available at taxfoundation.org slash bootcamp. I'm Jared Walczak, Vice President of State Projects at the Tax Foundation. And today we're going to focus on some new issues in state taxation, or at least some issues that uh, really haven't shown up that much in the states. Uh, I wanna focus on a few of those, but also want to preview briefly for you uh, where we're going to wrap up in this series, because next week, next Tuesday, will be our final session. And in that one, we are going to conclude this with some discussions about where states are right now. Uh, obviously, 2021 is a very unique year as we continue to respond to the pandemic, as we try to craft tax policy and other policies surrounding the pandemic. Some states are experiencing losses that they wouldn't have anticipated a little over a year ago. Uh, some have gains, but are still very uncertain. And obviously there are interaction effects with all of the federal legislation that has been enacted, whether it's Families First or CARES or uh, response and relief, or the most recent legislation, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, you know, which obviously has some interesting implications both in the aid that it provides states and questions about how that can be spent and what can be used on, and also what interaction that has with state fiscal policy, uh, particularly that provision regarding net tax cuts. So we'll be going into all of that uh, in our next session. I hope you'll join us for that. I think it'll be a very important session as we discuss what the options are for states in responding to their revenue needs or responding to these different bills. But today we want to take one last detour and talk about some of the new issues in state taxation, which I think actually dovetails into that because some of these ideas are being raised as potential responses to revenue losses. Uh, some of them because of current revenue losses, others perhaps propose early last year when it looked like those losses may have been more significant, but these ideas are still out there percolating. And if you've joined us for the first four sessions, uh, you recognize that we've talked a lot about trade-offs. We've talked about how there's no perfect tax, but there are a lot of taxes that meet various needs that uh, meet certain tests and you just have to balance them against each other. People often speak about the three-legged stool, you know, the you know, income sales and property taxes. I would add to that that unemployment insurance taxes are part of just every state's tax mix and are a very important tax uh, that no state goes without. And there's other taxes. Every state has a variety of excise taxes. The taxes we're talking about today aren't really part of that mix. They're taxes that most states don't have, and actually really basically no states have at this point, but they're being discussed. And we're calling them new issues in state taxation. Some of them are new. Some of them have been around as ideas for a while um, or maybe have existed in other countries, but they're relatively new here. And I'll just be straightforward here. We have tried very much to balance different concepts and different ideas uh, as we've discussed this. I'm a little more critical of what we'll be discussing here and I'll try to still provide a very balanced perspective on this, but you're going to hear probably a, a more negative perspective on these taxes than you've heard on some of the others. And partly that is because there's a reason why states have generally not adopted these proposals. Uh, you know, every tax was new at some point. Uh, every good idea was at some point new, but the vast majority of ideas in taxation that have not been tested substantially or have only shown up in a few places and not really been replicated, there's often a reason for that. And I think that's true of several of the taxes we'll be discussing here. So just that sort of proviso or that caveat on why maybe you're going to hear a, a little more skepticism today. But we hope this will be a good discussion. And if you have different views on these taxes, I hope you will reach out and we'll have a you know, dialogue with us. We'd love to talk with you about the implications of these taxes. At any point in the presentation, you can uh, put questions in the Q&A box and we'll be taking those at the end of the session. And you also, if you're listening uh, after the fact in one of our recordings, you can send me an email at jmw at taxfoundation.org and we'll certainly get back to you. One more housekeeping note, uh, those of you who are on the last call, uh, unfortunately we had some technical difficulties that cut it off about two or three minutes before we would have liked to wrap up that session. Uh, hopefully you all got most of the content and obviously we did send out a link that had an appended final few minutes so that you were able to watch you know, what would have been the conclusion to the event. We apologize for that. Uh, we should not have that problem today. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, jump into the actual session. <clears throat> talking first about wealth taxes and mark-to-market taxation of capital gains income, which is not the same thing, uh, but they've often been lumped together in this broad rubric of taxes on wealth or on um, 
investment, um, you know, ret returns on wealth in some respects. Um, so there's a variety of different reasons why states haven't and maybe can't adopt a wealth tax. Many states have constitutional constraints here, and they're going to vary. There are lots of different things in state constitutions that may serve to either restrict or prohibit a wealth tax. Uh, uniformity clauses are going to be one of these. Uh, wealth taxes are taxes on both tangible and intangible property. Intangible being things like financial instruments or um, investments, things like that. Tangible being obviously, you know, your artwork and, uh, you know, we're talking really wealthy people here, um, you know, things like that. And also on real property, obviously. Wealth taxes are generally going to apply to your real property. Um, yeah, so there are uniformity clauses that can come into place, play that might say that you need a uniform treatment of all property or within classes of property. And since a wealth tax is above and beyond a traditional property tax, that may be a problem. Uh, you may not be able to do that. There may also be restrictions on classes of property within a constitution that say that only, say, real and tangible personal property can be taxed, and you cannot tax intangible property, or you can't tax these other classes of property that would be implicated under wealth tax. Um, there are also limits in some states on taxing the income from property. This is a little more archaic. You don't really see this showing up that often, but it's actually directly addressing the issue um, here where you know, you, you have this economic rent or this economic income um, coming from property, uh, from its use, from its ownership. It's not necessarily income with flows. Um, it is stocks, but it is accumulating over time. I mean, even this is true with your house ownership. Uh, if you didn't own, you would have to rent. So there is an economic income associated with ownership. Uh, we don't often think of it that way, but an economist would treat it that way. And there have been some proposals that that's how you could handle a wealth tax, um, especially if you had a limit on, say, uh, a direct wealth tax. This is, you know, you move to market to market or something like that. We'll discuss what that means. But there are some states that are going to limit that because they limit um, taxing the income from property. Um, what's first, I think, important to understand when we're talking about wealth taxes is that what appear to be low rates can actually be very high rates because Obviously, this is an illiquid asset that we're taxing. Um, we are taxing, therefore, in some way, the returns or the expected returns on that asset. Let's assume, for sake of argument, that uh, a wealthy person subject to such a tax has a 7% annual rate of return on their investment and on, on the property they own that's investment properties. Um, it's actually not terribly high. I mean, it's sort of an average, and you know, some of the wealthier individuals may have much higher rates of return, but let's assume 7%. A 1% tax on their wealth imposed every year is equivalent to a 15.3% tax on the investment income arising from that wealth. Uh, to understand this, imagine you've got a billion dollars in taxable wealth, what we all wish, right? Um, you know, but to understand this, just think like, okay, that, that now produces $70 million in investment income. That's 7% return. So you've got 1.07 billion at the end of the year in wealth. The wealth tax obligation is 10.7 million dollars. Uh, that's a 15.3% return uh, tax on the investment gain. And the tax applies every year if the individuals are gaining or losing. If someone had that 1 billion in taxable wealth at the start of year one, lost 100 million uh, that year, and then gained 100 million in year two, they'd be back where they started. They have no net capital gains. Uh, but if they paid a wealth tax, they'd still owe 20 million um, on a 1% tax um, on $0 in investment income. And you can start to see why you're going to have some significant reactions to this. We're obviously talking about taxes that are imposed on the wealthiest of individuals. Um, different states have looked at this with different approaches. Uh, you know, Washington state has looked at this as a tax just on billionaires, potentially. Um, New York went, is going the market to market approach in its consideration, but also just on billionaires. California currently has one that's broader than that. It would capture millionaires um, as well. But we're talking about the wealthiest individuals who often are going to be very mobile and potentially taxing them very significant amounts. Uh, so you can imagine some avoidance activity. You can't tax someone who's not in your state. And you know, it's relatively easy for some of these individuals to change their residence. We'll get into that in a moment. Um, what's really significant here, though, is we have to think about the sort of assets that are being taxed. Yeah, um, we, we think about investments, and I think a lot of people think of publicly traded investments, because that's what most of us deal with. You know, we have mutual funds, we have, uh, maybe we, you know, play around in the equity market, we have our, our pensions or our retirement plans. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, 
when we're talking about wealthier individuals, though, a lot of this wealth may be tied up in privately owned companies, um, you know, a small or even large business owned by an individual or a small number of individuals who have ownership stakes in it. Uh, we're not talking in this case about publicly traded companies where you have a stock price um, and it's very easy, therefore, to assess its value at any point. Um, in this case, you could have an appreciation in the value of the company that it may be very hard for an assessment to be made on. I mean, we, we see that all the time where, you know, a company sells at a price that astonishes everyone because no one really had, you know, tried uh, valued it at that until the sale. But let's say that you try to assess it. Maybe you even get it right, but there's not a lot of cash flow right now. What do you do? If these were publicly traded shares, you would sell a portion of them and you would use the proceeds to pay the tax on what remain. These, in many cases, are not going to be publicly traded shares. It's much harder to sell a portion of your ownership stake in a privately held business. In fact, this can lead to it being broken up. Um, and that is one reason why most countries, as you can see on the map, um, most countries have gotten away from wealth taxes. And it's not because they didn't want to tax high income and high net worth individuals, but they realized they were starting to have a very serious deleterious effect on uh, business growth, business formation, because it really did take a lot of privately held businesses and restrict their ability to grow, uh, and in some cases result in them being broken up. I've used this example in a couple of places just because I maybe I'm too lazy to go buy more, but you can find a lot of examples like this of valuations. But um, you know, relatively recently, a um, you know, PayPal acquired an online coupon clipping company called Honey. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They show up in lots of social media ads. Um, but before its acquisition, it was a 200-person 200 company that raised $41 million in venture capital. It seems like it was generating decent returns, but you know, it wasn't creating phenomenal income for its founders. After its acquisition, its two founders split $4 billion. They're billionaires now. They're the sort of people that would probably be hit by a wealth tax. But here's the question. What would you have valued that company at before its acquisition? Would it have been in the $40 million range? $100 million? Would it have been... Four billion. I mean, in fact, the way it was sold, I think it was more like six billion because you know, the founders didn't get all of the money from this. Would you have valued it at six billion? You would have been maybe right, although I think that's a very speculative place to be. But at the time, how could anyone have paid a tax on a value of six billion when you know, their venture capital round had raised forty-one million and it wasn't bringing in a lot of profit at that point? Do you break this company up? Do you take this company that hasn't yet made it? and functionally destroy it. And that's the challenge of a wealth tax, that it, it does implicate all of this. And it also just implicates the question of how in the world you value a lot of assets that haven't been marketed for a very long time, these rarely valued assets. There's a strong incentive, moreover, to uh, leave a state, as I mentioned, that imposes a wealth tax. Washington state has proposed a 1% wealth tax on just financial assets above 1 million. So this solves one of the problems. You know, your business is not a financial asset. We fixed that. That's great. Um, but there's only uh, about a dozen billionaires in Washington. There's actually some uh, differences of opinion on that. Uh, Forbes says there's a dozen. Um, Washington State uh, has indicated they think there may be more that are right around that cusp of $1 billion. But because of a threshold of $1 billion, someone who's at like $1 billion, $100 million, like there's not, not actually a lot to tax there. Um, you know, so you know, about, seemingly about 12 billion, uh, 12 billionaires in the state. But here's the thing, four of them would account for 97% of the tax revenue. And ultimately, what if they leave? And not only does the state therefore lose the revenue that's associated with the new tax, but they potentially lose a lot of revenue from the existing taxes that those individuals pay. Now, Washington state doesn't have an income tax, so they're already not capturing that, but other states that do have an income tax could be losing an extraordinary amount in income tax revenue from individuals who leave to pay a wealth tax. And recall from previous sessions, you don't have to sell your property never come back uh, to not be subject to such a tax. You simply have to establish domicile elsewhere and people who are worth a billion dollars, they can do that. Um, California acknowledged this. They realized when they proposed their wealth tax, originally it was proposed as a 1% tax, now it's proposed as a graduated rate of up to one and a half percent. They realized, oh no, everyone's gonna leave. And therefore they put in a provision that said that you would continue to pay the wealth tax for 10 years after you moved out of state. Uh, the idea being they make it not worth moving out of state. Here's the reality. I don't think anyone believes you can do that constitutionally. 
you don't have that sort of trailing nexus. If a person has literally left your state, uh, you cannot continue to tax their wealth that may not have even been generated while you were in state uh, just because they once lived there. Um, it's you know a warning shot across the bow, I guess, but that's not going to work. Um, you know, states cannot continue to tax wealth of someone who is not actually a resident of the state or even generating that wealth in the state. As I mentioned, most European countries have abandoned wealth taxation. Uh, 12 used to have taxes on net wealth. Now only three have it on net wealth. There's another two that have very limited uh, forms of wealth taxes that are largely abated for most taxpayers. Um, but this is an idea that while new to the US states is not new to the world, it's just that it largely hasn't worked and it's been recognized as such that it has uh, you know, substantially curtailed economic activity. Uh, a narrower version of this, and we'll talk about some of the economic research when we talk about this, is mark to market taxation. And this is about the taxation of capital gains income. We do, of course, tax capital gains. It's reasonable, um, I think, to tax capital gains. Not everyone agrees on that, but you know, we do tax them um, at both the federal and state level. We give uh, preferential treatment of long-term capital gains at the federal level. Uh, there is no such preferential treatment of long-term gains at, at the state level. States tax these gains as ordinary income. However, at both the federal and the state level, capital gains are taxed upon realization. So you, know, you, you buy some shares, they appreciate in value. When you sell them and realize that gain, you pay uh, capital gains income tax on the income generated during that sale, the, the net uh, gain. The proposal with mark to market, which at the state level has been a proposal to get around a constitutional constraint on a traditional wealth tax, is what if we tax them on unrealized gains? What if every year or every quarter or you know, some other amount of time, we tax the paper appreciation? You know, the stock has risen by X percent, tax it even though it hasn't been sold. <clears throat> this has been proposed at the federal level as well. Um, you know, Senator Wyden uh, has proposed something like this, um, but there are states that are looking at this now, uh, led by New York, looking at this as a way to generate additional revenue. And the mere fact that it generates a lot of additional revenue tells you something strange is going on. It's not just a timing issue. It's not just that the state's getting the money a little earlier and benefiting, obviously, from the time value of money. There is benefit to the state and against the taxpayer of uh, having this paid first. But it's, uh, it's actually changing what would be paid in tax, even though it's not supposed to. It, ideally, if you're structuring this right, it changes, uh, doesn't change ultimate taxability, but it changes timing. Uh, but ultimately, this has a lot of effects, some of them very similar to a wealth tax. Um, taxing unrealized income can easily disrupt the source of that income. When an asset's taxed upon its realization, the realization event itself produces the liquid assets from which the tax can be paid. Uh, even taxing unrealized gains from publicly traded assets is, uh, I guess, reasonably straightforward. It's not great, but you know, some portion of your shares could be sold to satisfy the tax liability. This still has consequences for wealthy investors who might be trying to retain a controlling interest or want to balance their portfolio in a certain way um, or don't want to sell at a certain point in time because that may be um, not a, a, an economically wise choice. It may not be a prudent investment decision, but you have this capacity. You can liquidate some of your shares. With a private business asset, the tax can be much more consequential, same way as the wealth tax. Some portion of the company or its assets may have to be sold to pay taxes on gains that exist only on paper. The owners can be asset rich, but cash poor. And research indicates that the long run elasticity of capital gain with respect to taxation is between zero, negative 0 0.6 and negative 0 0.79. This means that a 10% increase in the tax rates on capital gains uh, leads to an approximately 7.9% reduction up to that in, uh, in the capital gains. That's actually really significant. That's a very high elasticity in tax. These are sensitive uh, to the tax burdens and now we're talking about bringing these tax burdens up, not only making them more aggressive because of timing, but imposing them on gains that may not really exist. And the New York proposal and some of the others that have been floated don't do a very good job of offsetting against capital losses. Because remember, um, you know, capital gains and capital losses traditionally offset. Um, and there's some limits on how you can carry them forward. It's already not a perfect system. But here, you pay on the net gains every year, and there aren't very good solutions for offsetting the net losses, when they occur, you could have a situation where you paid on gains that existed on paper for years, and then you actually sell the asset at a loss, and it takes years in which you can recoup, or maybe you never get to recoup. Under some proposals, you would never get to recoup. There's gains 
that you never experienced would result in significant tax liability uh, while you actually post a loss. <clears throat> that is obviously not consistent with principles of taxation, um, whether whether you think this should be taxed in the realization event or uh, taxed at an earlier time in a staggered way. But that's where these proposals stand right now. Um, it, it looks like I mean, New York is taking this somewhat seriously. Other states are thinking about it. We'll see if it takes off. But uh, certainly we're in a moment where wealth taxes and uh, you know, um, you know, these mark to market tax regimes for you know, capital gains income are gaining some interest and gaining some popularity. But it's important to remember what the consequences of that will be, that it means reduced investment, it means reduced economic activity, it can mean breaking up businesses. And very obviously, because it's pretty easy to shift uh, across borders, it can mean just losing a lot of your highest net worth taxpayers. Um, <clears throat> Let's jump from there to uh, financial transaction taxes, um, because this is another idea that you know, I think is very similar in the sense that it is designed around high net worth individuals. <clears throat> but unlike a wealth tax, it doesn't stop there uh, because these, these can't exempt individuals who are lower income, lower net worth. Uh, it's simply based on the idea that, well, you know, wealthy people are involved in uh, financial transactions more. This is true. But that doesn't mean that they're not really important for an awful lot of people, uh, many of whom don't have a brokerage account, but they do have a pension, they do have a 401k, um, you know, some of whom are um, you know, perhaps uh, trading directly in the market. Um, obviously, we've seen a rise of retail investing, but whether or not you're in retail investing, this affects you. <clears throat> there are three broad types of financial transaction taxes. You can tax the exchange. You can tax the servers, essentially where the processing of the transaction takes place, or you can tax the traders. And each of those can involve a different state. Um, you know, taxing the exchanges, you only have a few states that could potentially do that. New York could do it, obviously, right now, because they have the New York Stock Exchange, they have the NASDAQ. Um, Illinois could do it because they have the Chicago Exchange. And there are other states where there are exchanges of you know, smaller sizes. Yeah, and you have exchanges for different things. I mean, we usually think of these big stock exchanges, but you have commodity exchanges. You have a lot of different exchanges. So you know, states that house one of those exchanges could theoretically tax that. New Jersey recently inaugurated the idea that you could tax the digital processing of the transaction, which is a theory that works very well for New Jersey because the uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ actually have their data processing across the border in New Jersey. So the idea was that they tax all the transactions that go through and are processed on their servers. Um, and then, of course, any state theoretically could impose a tax either yeah, per transaction or ad valorem on the trading itself. So if you as the investor uh, are involved in a transaction, then your state taxes you on participating in that transaction. Note, of course, that this creates at least the possibility that three different states could tax that transaction. You could have New York, New Jersey, and your state all tax it. Obviously, we don't have any states currently doing this, so that's not a scenario that exists, but New York's looking at it. New Jersey was, um, I think that may have fallen a little by the wayside, but could come back. Um, and there are a number of states that have been talking about doing something on the transactions themselves. There's always a question of base here what it applies to. It could be just stocks, it could be stocks and bonds, it could be a broader definition of financial transactions, it can include commodity exchange, it can include a lot of different things and uh, different proposals have uh, you know, potentially taxed uh, a wide variety of uh, different things. There's only been one example of a stock transfer tax or financial transaction tax at the state level that's been of any significance, and that actually was in New York. For a very long time, they had a stock transfer tax uh, in the early 1980s, it was abated. It wasn't taken off the books, but it's fully refunded immediately. No one has paid it since the 1980s. And at the time, there was a recognition that New York's status as financial capital of the world was you know, pretty secure. But nonetheless, um, as technology was rising, it would have been easier for more of those transactions to go elsewhere. The industry made a push. The industry got the tax abated. Um, whether you think they could have moved in 1980, the reality is that they could very easily move in, 19, in, in 2021. And in fact, that has been a huge issue as there's been discussion of bringing this back, maybe even at higher levels. Uh, you know, the, the major exchanges based in New York have indicated to lawmakers that it is not actually terribly difficult if it's gonna save them $12 billion a year to um, relocate to another state in an era where the technology easily facilitates that, where most of the transactions do not involve people being physically present. You could have people who want to remain in New York who could, 
you can have people working anywhere in the country that the you know, the status of New York City as the financial capital of the world doesn't have to be anymore. And I think that has worried a lot of New York officials and uh, will probably be an important consideration for them because you have all of these individuals who have chosen to be in New York because that's where the exchange is. What happens if they leave? Um, you know, maybe the traders follow them or maybe they could just get anywhere. You know, maybe they realize this location doesn't matter for a lot of that anymore. Um, but we do have some examples in other countries where uh, there's stock transfer taxes or other sorts of financial transaction taxes have been imposed. And those are interesting because they are environments where it is harder to shift the transactions. The New York Stock Exchange can just cease to be the New York Stock Exchange. They can be the stock exchange in another state. Uh, but it is harder in you know, a European country to shift that across borders. Uh, so for instance, um, Sweden implemented a financial transaction tax for a number of years between 1984 and 1991. It only taxed trades intermediated by Swedish brokerages. Well, what happened? Swedish brokerages lost a lot of business. Uh, over 30% of their business pretty quickly moved to London and almost all the new business, you know, all, everything that was newly placed on the market ended up in exchanges outside of the country, even though there were significant costs for uh, you know, Swedish businesses being listed on another exchange and going through different brokerages, there were that this was not you know friction free. It still made sense for it all to shift over there, which is why Sweden abolished this tax in 1991. Um, uh, the Urban Institute, an economist over there, James Nunn's, um, suggested that a half percent financial transaction tax on stocks would reduce trades by as much as 85 percent. That sounds like an insane amount, but you know, the, that's this half a percent. Um, and that just gives you an idea of how small a tax could theoretically be to reduce trades. Now, what that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we're gonna stop trading. It means that trade volume is going to go way down. Um, and trade volume is obviously different than market capitalization. It's you know, different than the ownership in the market. So the question becomes, do we care? <clears throat> and there are some people who say, no, maybe we shouldn't care. This is going to have this huge effect on high frequency trading. Um, you're going to reduce that activity. And maybe that's a good thing. Because a lot of people have qualms about high frequency trading and whether it's really good for our markets. Um, you know, some would argue that reducing you know, HFT will um, rein in speculation and limit volatility. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence on that. There's research and it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, I've, I've reviewed some of it and uh, there's some evidence that maybe it uh, has that effect of, um, it certainly reduces the trading. Um, maybe it has an effect on reigning in speculation, but it doesn't seem to have much. Uh, there's some that actually suggest the other, the opposite approach that um, the trades become more speculative and more unmoored um, from information um, and that the volatility is therefore worse. Uh, at the best you can say is that the research is uh, muddled and we don't know whether it reigns in speculation. What we do know, what's really overwhelmingly true in the literature and just makes sense is that um, if you have a, a financial transaction tax, um, you are going to reduce liquidity and you are going to reduce information in the market. When they can't be avoided, financial transaction tax raise both the implicit and the explicit transaction costs. So they reduce that trading volume. They lower asset prices. It's bad for markets overall because higher transaction costs disfavor the rebalancing of portfolios. They decrease liquidity and they discourage investment in the lower return investments. This is especially true if they are a tax that is a set amount, a specific tax on the transaction. Obviously, if you pay the same tax on buying a share of a $5 stock and buying a you know, class A share of Berkshire Hathaway, um, the, the tax is being you know, imposed in a much more um, unfavorable way on your $5 stock. Uh, to say nothing of penny stocks, but you know, uh, again, you could get the arguments of you know, whether that's something to be reined in. Um, but what happens then is not only do you discourage investment in these lower return investments, you decrease what's termed price discovery. This is the mechanism by which new information is incorporated into asset prices. And you make it a much more, um, you know, a market with a lot more rapid swings because people um, with, with the lack of liquidity, when they want out, it can be much harder to sell uh, and that can create cascading effects. And also information takes longer to filter through because you don't have that sort of high volume that can signal issues early on. So a lot of the research suggests that this ultimately creates more volatile markets and ones that are more subject to 
uh, longer runs of bad following bad, where there's you know just bad investment. Um, but again, the you know one of the significant issues here is that you know, these are in some ways easily avoided. Um, certainly, the taxes on the exchanges, the servers, you can move those probably without too much issue. A tax on the trades may be harder to avoid. Obviously, your wealthiest individuals, if they care about this, they may be able to move. But the average person who uh, you know, has a retirement account, has a pension fund, um, you know, does a little trading in equities, uh, they're unlikely to move for this. They're just likely to bear some of these costs. So it's just important to remember that the people getting hit by this are not just the wealthy. They're also your, uh, you know, your middle class families your individuals who may have a uh, government funded pension that would be in, you know, in, in these markets. It's very broad. I mean, this is really most Americans, even if we don't often think about that. And given the types of portfolios that individuals hold, it actually ends up taxing disproportionately those who are more, you know, middle income investors. Again, the, the, you know, the, the overall amounts uh, in nominal terms, I mean, much higher on wealthier investors, but the way these are usually designed um, you know, just the, the balance of portfolios, you're going to see a higher effective rate on a, a more middle class family or a, a investor, uh, sort of an unusual design. Again, no states have these currently, but they are percolating in a lot of states. I think that we will likely see these. And there is just sort of this question of why particularly we want to tax this. You know, we had that presentation by Ulrich last week on excise taxes, and you get, this is an excise tax. Um, and you have the question, what externality are you trying to internalize? What social cost are you trying to address? Is investment a social ill that we want to do something about? Because again, we tax the income. You know, your capital gains income is taxed. Uh, it's not like this is some sort of untaxed activity. It's a question, do we want to tax it above and beyond because we treat it as some sort of harm or some sort of sin? And you know, it seems unusual to treat investment as a sin or a harm to be internalized. And it's worth recognizing that this isn't just about the wealthy, even though they have major effects on tax collections and uh, their ability to avoid this tax is very significant. Uh, but it's really about your, your middle class investor as well, something to be aware of as you, you know, think about those sort of things. Uh, another tax that I want to discuss, a uh, very new issue, this one truly is new, um, <clears throat> is digital advertising and data taxes. Um, Maryland recently became the first state to adopt such a tax and is in the process of implementing that uh, now. Um, and this was actually, they, they passed the bill last year, it was vetoed and they overrode the veto earlier this spring. Their tax is imposed on large ad platforms, um, but there could be differences in designs. I will be speaking a little sort of on the assumption of a design similar to Maryland and I'll describe what they do. Obviously, it doesn't have to look exactly like Maryland, but um, the other states that have considered a tax on digital advertising have actually largely done a, a copy-paste job, so um, it's probably a good way to think about this. Um, despite being imposed as a tax on large ad platforms, the economic incidence is largely going to be on in-state businesses and their customers. The Maryland bill was designed to target out-of-state companies. That actually raises some legal issues. It doesn't explicitly say it only taxes out-of-state companies, but it designed the thresholds in such a way to exclude all Maryland companies and only tax basically your Silicon Valley type companies. Um, and that there are some constitutional issues if you clearly design to tax foreign commerce exclusively. Um, but the thing is legal and economic incidents are not the same thing. I hope that's something that's come through in all of our discussions over the last few weeks. The taxes imposed on revenue from digital advertising served to people in Maryland, which will drive up the cost of advertising to Marylanders. Um, the advertisers will bear most of the additional cost, and uh, many of those advertising to Maryland residents are going to be Maryland-based businesses. Uh, the revenue thresholds might be designed to tax the Googles and Facebooks of the world, but to me, the Maryland businesses, many of the small businesses, uh, they're the ones actually paying. And because it's constituted as a gross receipts tax, it's, it's a tax designed essentially on the gross revenues from advertising into the state of Maryland and other states that have looked at this have said basically the same thing, gross revenues um, you know, on this advertising. It's not based on ability to pay, nor are the rates dependent on the size or the revenues of the business purchasing the advertising and thus likely bearing the burden of the tax. In Maryland, the tax rates are instead dependent on the size of the advertising network meaning that large multinational businesses um, advertising on a local news site would face no tax. 
Uh, a local restaurant, on the other hand, uh, small, purchasing keyword advertising on a search engine would bear the highest possible tax rate. Constitutional issues here as well. You're taking out-of-state characteristics and you're imposing a tax rate based on that. We have a paper on this that you can look into. If you want to go into some of those additional details, I'll talk about a little here, but not go into a huge amount of depth because partly that's a design choice Maryland made. You could obviously impose a digital advertising tax that had a flat rate that didn't take into account the size of the company um, providing the advertising services. That's something Maryland chose to do. It's something that other states that have copied them have looked at doing. But you could design around that particular constitutional problem. The, a study of a French digital, digital advertising tax concluded that 55% of the advertising costs were borne by the consumers and that the rest um, was borne largely by the businesses advertising, not by the uh, advertising platforms. There may be a slight switch here. I think that you might be able to make an argument that the way that it would work in the United States, that a little more of it would be borne by the business. Um, but the reality is you've got this split. It's gonna be the, the advertising business and the consumers. Um, the big ad platforms may suffer by having a slightly lower volume of ad sales, uh, but the cost of the tax will be borne by in-state residences, um, you know, businesses or their consumers. Uh, and remember advertising, digital advertising tends to be dynamically priced. If any of you have ever participated in that, um, you, know, you know that there's not just like one tax for, you know, one, one price for advertising to anyone. There's different prices for different demographics, different geographic areas, um, different targeting. So it's very easy for this to just be baked into the price. If you're advertising into a state that has one of these taxes, it gets built into that dynamic pricing. And if such taxes catch on, they also put more of the internet behind a paywall. Uh, ad supported services become a worse deal compared to subscription models. And right now both of those coexist and they both have their place. Uh, but I don't know that we want the an advertising tax to determine uh, whether something is behind a paywall or not. Now, there are a lot of issues here. Firstly, apportioning digital ads to a state is really difficult. If you want to tax advertising into a state, you have to determine whether it's there. So you are probably going to start with the IP, the Internet Protocol Address. Um, uh, Maryland uses that or whether a person's device is known or reasonably suspected to be located in the state at that time. But what we call geofencing is tough. How do you handle questions of when an ad's blocked and doesn't actually get served or where the IP address and you know, uh, the place viewed might be different? IP addresses are not perfect. They're often you know, your IP, your ISP, your server. It may not be where you are. Proxy servers make this even more difficult. Um, and it's also hard to even define advertising. I mean, traditional ads are fine. We know what a banner ad is. That's clearly digital advertising. What about sponsored or branded content? What about email market, marketing, voice over IP sales calls that use the internet, um, an ad that was originally in an untaxed medium and then transmitted digitally. So think, for instance, a radio station, a terrestrial radio station or a TV that's streamed over the internet, um, which is very commonly available with subscription services now. And you may see the ads that were broadcast in another format. They're now digital. How are they subject to this? There's not a price on the digital ad that wasn't priced out. How do you tax that? Uh, so a lot of complex questions about how in the world you're supposed to do this. Maryland answered none of them, by the way, um, and they're still trying to figure out how you implement this. Um, you know, they punted on almost all the hard questions. But there's also some real legal constraints. One is something you may have heard of called the Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act. In the early days of the internet, um, there was a huge concern at the federal level that states were going to start taxing all kinds of digital activity in ways that wouldn't allow the internet to get off the ground. We're obviously in a different place now, but Congress has made some of that permanent. So we now call it the Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act. It was amended and, um, you know, in 2016, made permanent. It prohibits discriminatory taxes on electronic commerce. The federal law does not ban state taxes on transactions just because they take place online. I mean, obviously we have sales tax, we call online sales tax, you know, those remote seller laws. Um, we can tax all kinds of digital activity, but it cannot single out e-commerce. A tax on all advertising, including digital advertising, wouldn't defend federal law. But a tax that only targets digital advertising without being imposed on similar offline activity runs up against the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And that's what we've seen thus far. The Maryland law does that. Proposals in California and New York and um, I believe in uh, Montana have all done this. Um, and there's a few other states that are looking at this as well. There's also a constitutional question. The 
Constitution, we talk about the dormant commerce clause, um, or some, you know, it's sort of the, the um, it's read into the commerce clause, the idea that the Constitution prohibits states from imposing taxes, which discriminate against interstate commerce, and requires that taxes on multi-state businesses be reasonably related to their in-state activities. States have pretty broad latitude in designing their own tax codes, but it's not unlimited authority, as we've discussed in some of our previous sessions. So under this dormant commerce clause analysis, states can't enact legislation that's, quote, inimical to national commerce, and they can't have legislation that would, quote, uh, impede the flow of interstate commerce. So when you have an approach like Maryland, where you've got different rates based on the out-of-state sales of a company, um, that seems to be inherently discriminatory. It's taking these out-of-state characteristics. But even if you don't have that, you, you have some problems if you're just targeting the out-of-state firms, whether you are, if you are making out-of-state sales into the state more difficult than in-state sales, uh, without a really compelling justification, you, you may have some problems under the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, you know, because like Maryland, for instance, has a threshold before the tax applies, $100 million of gross sales nationwide. Uh, basically, it's a threshold chosen to make sure that none of the Maryland-based ad platforms are subject to this, uh, but others would be. Uh, state courts, uh, courts have also held that states can only tax, quote, that portion of the revenues from the interstate activity, which reasonably reflects the in-state component of the activity being taxed. Uh, this is basically a working definition of what's called the external consistency test. Um, a taxable activity must be apportioned to states in some reasonable and defensible manner based on the company's activity. So if you're taxing this, you know, gross revenues from advertising in a state, that probably meets the test. But only if a court would determine that the proxy chosen actually reflects the in-state activity. And again, this is going to be really tough. It's surprisingly hard for states to determine what ads were actually viewed in state. Um, and you know, the court could not qualify the tax on that ground. It's at least something where a state would want to take very seriously how you approach that uh, so that you can uh, tax this in a way that doesn't violate that external consistency test. There's a bottom line on this, though, which is a principal question. Why are we taxing it? Um, when digital ad taxes were proposed in Maryland, it was based on a, um, a, a, an op-ed written by a prominent, uh, very good economist um, who wanted to use a digital ad tax very much in the Pugovian sense of you know, a restriction on sin. In fact, he wanted to go so far, which I think would be unconstitutional, to make it a prohibition on the sin of targeted advertising. Right? His hope was that you could impose a tax so high that targeted advertising would cease to exist. Um, Maryland ran with this, but with a different approach. They didn't want it to be so high that there'd be no advertising. They just wanted to generate revenue from advertising. Uh, but then the question is why? Uh, since they lacked the rationale of trying to regulate or prohibit it, it became the rationale that it was under tax. And that was borrowed from Europe, where under the value-added tax uh, regimes that existed in, uh, in countries in Europe, uh, particularly within the EU, uh, there were some ways in which digital services, not just digital, digital advertising, would be sourced nowhere and therefore wouldn't be taxed. Europe has largely addressed those questions in recent years, uh, but it's never existed in the United States. The way we do corporate enforcement, go back to our uh, first session, um, doesn't create that problem. Advertising services are taxed like any other corporate services. Um, you know, it's just it's not a hole in the uh, in, in the budget. It's not a hole in your revenue uh, system. So there's not really this unique justification other than that maybe we don't think that highly of advertising. Um, but thinking back to I think it was our second session when we discussed sales taxes. Uh, this isn't a sales tax, but it is a tax. It's an excise tax, essentially, on a certain activity. Why are we targeting it? And what does it mean to tax what's clearly a business input? It's an intermediate transaction. You do this, you treat it differently than everything else. You're going to create tax pyramiding. You're going to make things more expensive for the businesses that are engaging in this advertising, again, most of which will be on, in state. Now, this is distinct from a sales tax on digital goods or personal digital services. That can make a lot of sense. Um, you know, if you are subscribing to a streaming service, there's no reason why that shouldn't be taxed in the same way that renting a DVD would have been. Um, if you are, um, you know, you know, if you're using a lot of different digital goods or services, sales tax makes sense on those if they're final consumer products. But what we're talking about here isn't sales tax, and it's on what's clearly an um, intermediate transaction. You know, there's some definite issues that arise here. Uh, the states haven't sorted out both, you know, well, legal, um, you know, implementation. Uh, and just the rationale that's in place for this.
And then let's finally wrap up by looking at some things that are really, you know, West Coast issues thus far, but we could see elsewhere. I think a few states, I think even Rhode Island has looked at some of these too. Um, excess compensation taxes and business head taxes. Excess compensation taxes are a pretty new idea. Portland inaugurated this a couple of years ago. You take some existing business tax and then you use the ratio of the highest compensated employee, you might say CEO, but whoever the highest compensated employee is, and the median full-time employee salary. And you use that in some sort of graduated rate to create a surtax, where having a higher ratio of executive compensation to median compensation means you pay more in your overall taxes. Um, and you know, Portland has this, San Francisco just adopted one on the ballot, just going into effect. Um, you know, the, there's um, not a lot of experience with these, obviously, because it's just two cities, but a number of states are looking at them right now. Now, it's unlikely that a few city taxes will have an effect on C-suite compensation, uh, so it doesn't really directly tackle the inequality question that they are predicated on right now, but we can see states doing this, and that would be a much more significant thing. Uh, maybe that reduces C-suite compensation, maybe it doesn't. Um, you know, there is a question of whether it would, because presumably, whether they're right or wrong, corporations are seeking to pay their CEO what they're worth to the company. There's pretty good reason to think they often get this wrong. I mean, we all read the stories of uh, you know, CEOs that were pretty clearly overpaid based on what they actually produced for the company. But presumably, the company didn't anticipatorily believe that. Um, they, they have no reason to want to overpay CEOs in most cases. Um, and they would have gone with a lesser compensated chief executive if they thought that that would yield the same results for their company. So they're going to do the same analysis. And this additional cost will be part of it. That CEO, the highly compensated CEO, costs even more now. So it might push them down towards someone who is uh, more cost effective or you know, change their negotiations. Uh, and, you know, I guess whether they're right or wrong about what, what they were currently paying them and the value proposition they put on those will indicate how much of a loss that will be. But if they were right that you know, certain executives were yielding you know, certain results, then you would see losses for shareholders and wage earners because the company didn't do so well. If they're wrong, I guess you solve that problem, but then you've got the fundamental problem of like, why are they so consistently wrong? Uh, you know, just questions that are you know, maybe beyond our scope here. Uh, but here's the thing. If even if C-suite compensations reduce, there's no reason to believe that any of that accrues to employees. Uh, they're already paid, you know, what the market will bear. Um, you know, whether we think that's right or wrong, whether there's other policies that some might do to try to raise that. When you talk about minimum raise, wage increases, you talk about other policies out there. Um, you know, lowering someone else's salary doesn't automatically mean that you raise someone's salary. That's subject to broader market conditions. So it just becomes this additional tax on these industries. And you know, some might say, well, okay, that's still fair. Like, it still like, strikes me as fair. These companies, they have all this money. Um, this makes sense. And you know, they, if they can afford to pay someone that much, maybe we should tax them more. It's important to think about what companies get affected by this. Because yeah, so to some degree it's the tech companies, but they also have high median pay. It's often going to be companies like say grocery store chains, where the CEO is compensated very well, but not disproportionately to other CEOs. It's just that they have a lot of, uh, you know, sort of introductory level employees, um, you know, people stocking shelves, things like that. And whatever one thinks about whether their salary should be higher, they're clearly going to be a lower median than a tech company. They're clearly going to be a lower median than a lot of other, you know, companies that have, you know, higher end um, employees at different stages of their career. So this is a tax that falls more on companies that employ uh, lower skilled or often younger employees than those who have higher skilled, um, higher educated, more senior employees, uh, which doesn't necessarily seem to solve the problems that it's trying to solve. It does potentially raise revenue, um, but of course that depends on um, you know, whether it changes the activity within a city. A state's gonna be harder to avoid, so we'll, we'll see what happens if a state tries to do this. Um, it's been pretty rare thus far. Um, there is a legal question here too, and it's really the same one that affects a lot of these new taxes. And there's a reason why most of these new taxes are new, um, because they raise serious constitutional questions. But that's, again, using the out-of-state activity. Um, if, say, your state adopts one of these, and the CEO doesn't live in the state, in fact, the corporate headquarters is elsewhere, uh, what justification do you have to set a tax based on the compensation of people who are not in the state for a business that's not headquartered in the state? Um, that's bringing in characteristics that seem to have no 
relation to the company's utilization of the state or its enjoyment of its markets. Real constitutional questions. Now, I will say, again, this tax has existed for a couple of years in Portland, hasn't raised a lot of revenue, has not been challenged. Brand new in San Francisco, too new to know if it would be challenged, but it has existed for a couple of years and has not been challenged. But I think that if a state were to do this, you could see a legal challenge. Um, we also have business head taxes. And these looked like they were catching on briefly. Uh, Seattle was trying to adopt one for a couple of years and briefly did adopt one. And there were a bunch of jurisdictions that were very eager to do what Seattle did. Then Seattle repealed it before it ever went into effect. And for the most part, these petered out. Um, now, some states, some jurisdictions impose wage taxes, usually paid by employees, occasionally paid by employers. Most of them are very low. Uh, but when they reach a point where they're significantly higher, they're about the same as a wage tax. So there's this like, you know, we say that there are wage taxes. There are a few things in different jurisdictions that, you know, maybe you could feel are relatively close. But the idea here is a tax that's imposed per employee on large employees, employers. Um, and again, even more so than the previous discussion, this often is going to fall on uh, low margin employers like supermarket chains because they have just large numbers of employees. And of course, because they're paid less than someone, you know, high income, you know, a high tech company, for instance, um, it's going to be a much more significant tax for them. This is very atypical. Governments usually incentivize job creation. Sometimes they do it very poorly. We have a lot of incentives uh, for creating jobs. Um, you often see like $3,000 or $5,000 credits for creating a new job. This is taxes of a few hundred dollars uh, for creating and maintaining a job. Uh, Seattle repealed theirs very quickly. Cupertino was looking at one and ultimately decided to shelve it. Only Mountain View, California currently has one. And it's an unusual situation where the mayor was quoted as saying that they had too many good paying jobs and they actually wanted to reduce that employment somewhat so that they could have a broader mix of employment. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, I think that most states and most cities probably do not want to reduce their number of good jobs, um, but you know, that was the proposal there. But Chicago repealed one at a much lower level when Rahm Emanuel was mayor. Um, Seattle Mayor Jenny Duncan vetoed a second effort at this. They seem like there's something that is losing steam, not gaining it. So I included here, but I'd say that like two or three years ago, there was a thought that a lot of big cities were going to impose these head taxes because they wanted to find a new way to tax people who were working in the city but didn't live there and do it through their employers by you know, focusing only on the larger employers. And for the most part, we seem to have had a reversion to the more general view, which is you want to create jobs. You do not want to disincentivize jobs. Uh, so these don't seem to be a big deal, but they're still out there. And they're just this, they, they cross cut. They, they, they cut against uh, what we sort of think is the typical approach to uh, you know, state tax policy, especially as it surrounds jobs. So that, that covers, I think, a lot of the things that um, we plan to cover. It doesn't look like we have any questions. I mean, I realize this is a different session. Um, this is more of a critique of some of the new issues in state taxation. Maybe that generates fewer questions than we were going through the mechanics of a lot of the taxes. I hope, though, that you will all join us when we come back next week for what I think will be a very valuable session discussing states' options uh, during uh, the hopefully final months of this pandemic and responding to the revenue losses that many experienced, or at least the lower revenues. Um, looking at what that revenue picture is, looking at things like uh, you know how you treat forgiven loans under the Paycheck Protection Program, how you treat unemployment compensation. The federal government is now providing a tax exclusion for the first 10,200 of uh, what you do with this question within um, the, the new legislation on net tax cuts and what that means and what we might expect in guidance. We'll go through all of this. Uh, we would really appreciate you know, all of you coming for one last session. We know it's a major commitment for many of you to have tuned in for five weeks and now to ask you one more week, but we hope that many of you have found these sessions beneficial, uh, that maybe you will return to them at a later date or uh, in, in, uh, let others know that these are available. They are on our website at taxfoundation.org slash bootcamp, and we'll keep them there. We also have materials located there, um, you know, papers and blog posts and other resources related to the things we've discussed in each one of these sessions, plus the videos and the audio of each of these. And uh, we actually added a paper to last week. So we had that excise tax discussion. My colleague, colleague Ulrich Boson, who presented in that, has just published a great new paper on excise tax as a primer on all of these issues, going through the individual taxes, but also the theory. If you're interested in that, we put that in the session materials for last week's session. You can go back and take a look. Uh, but again, thank you all so much, and hope you'll join us next week for our last session. Have a great day.